So let's talk about the Clinton global reset agenda. Farmers around the world are revolting because of strict new environmental guidelines being pushed on by the World Economic Forum. We've been covering it here on the show. This model, of course, is called ESG, and it's being driven by one of the biggest companies in the world, BlackRock, which, of course, owns everything. They, along with Vanguard, pretty much own the world. Um, BlackRock owns every company you probably use on a daily basis, by the way. Here's just a few. This is literally like their their top 13. They own uh, United Healthcare, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, ExxonMobil, Pfizer, NVIDIA, Netflix, Google, Disney, PayPal, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. I mean, on and on and on the list goes. Um, they own huge shares and percentages in all of these companies. And that's just the top of the list. They own everything. They have their hands in everything, right? So um, the ESG model is one of the main causes of the Sri Lankan government's recent dramatic collapse, right? As fuel and food prices skyrocketed to unaffordable uh, levels following the country's adherence to the World Economic Forum's nitrogen reduction initiative. It's also the, the main mechanism, of course, that sparked the farmers' rebellion in the Netherlands. And the Dutch farm and the Dutch government said, you know, the country was going to bend the knee basically to these ESG protocols and we're going to cut these nitrogen emissions. We're going to buy up what farmland we can. And if you're in one of these areas that you need that you have high numbers on the map, we're going to just cull your livestock as well. Right. We're going to kill off all your livestock because you're not adhering to these numbers and uh, bye. We're going to take your farm. No problem. That's part of the ESG protocol, you know, so we can be compliant with that. So it was kind of surprising, or maybe not surprising, to see Bill Clinton kick off day one of his Clinton Global Summit uh, to push the Great Reset agenda. And he's been doing it all week, in, in day after day after day. And on the second day, the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, was on stage. And it was really like an unbelievable discussion about how they plan to, to screw us all over. That's really what the agenda was. Like, here's the agenda item for the day. Uh, 8 a.m., screw over the world. Then we'll take a lunch break. And we'll come back and we'll we'll continue screwing over the world for the rest of the day. And what's for lunch? The little people. <laughs> right. No, it'll be plant-based. It'll be beyond meat. Beyond meat, little people. Beyond meat, little people. <laughs> Bill Clinton kicked off day two of the event by praising Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, for their aggressive push for the environment and ESG regulations. Listen. I want to thank you for a lot of things. I want to thank you for urging people to consider the social impact of their investments and to try not just to go for a quick rate of return if it's damaging to society, but instead to try to build a f future we can all share. But what does that mean now? Well, what's going to happen? How's, what do you think for the next six, seven months? How's Russia going to play into this? How's the pandemic going to play into this? It, it won't go away. Someone trying to clap. Us, apparently. <laughs> So they're just trying to get ketchup out of a we, bottle. What do you think? No. <laughs> well, Mr. President, thank you for inviting me here. I mean, it's just like it's like Grandpa Clinton sitting there just like, you know, just I'm just like to hear myself talk. I'm just going to keep talking. And I don't well, know. Not, why didn't they call this a fireside chat too? That's <laughs> <Right>. what <laughs> it felt like. One. This would actually. Did I say George Clinton? I hope I didn't say the funk. I hope I didn't say George Clinton. I hope I said Bill Clinton. But <laughs> if someone in the chat said, did Clinton say George Clinton? I hope I didn't. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, asking him, you know, praising him about all his ESG initiatives. And ESG is such an interesting thing, right? I mean, if you read v uh, Vivek Raswami's book and you understand you understand how these companies basically try to act, you know, they try to go woke with these policies but the policies are flawed in and of themselves, right? Yes, and the, the ESG, it, there's not even a standards base for how you slap that label on something. Right. Um, yes, it is totally just a way to sell yourself your own superiority while you are investing in things that you, you know, like that you're only doing consciously. And in fact, the person, his name escapes me at this point, um, who came up with the idea of ESGs and really is the founder and the salesperson behind it, is one of the major investors in a Chinese fossil fuel um, 
company. So he, you know, he doesn't even do what he preaches. No, and Elon Musk has called the whole thing a fraud because, of course, it's like environmental uh, s. Um, I always forget the s and and governance um, society. Right. And so literally the scale is like, how good do you feel about Tesla? Like that's literally part of the metric. Like, how do you feel and hear about Tesla? Right. And, and so we've looked through some of these companies that are given an ESG rating. And, you know, most of the oil and gas companies are higher rated than, say, Tesla or any other, you know, renewables. It's it it is completely just sort of a way to, um, you know, measure your own superiority meanwhile and sentiment and we should also point out that blackrock itself attorneys general from 19 states have called on the securities and exchange commission to investigate blackrock the world's largest asset manager over its aggressive push on esgs in fact here's the front page of uh, the the uh, new york post um Based on the facts currently available to us, BlackRock appears to use the hard-earned money of our state citizens to circumvent the best possible return on investment as well as their vote, the attorneys general said in a letter to the SEC. So, uh, you know, just to be clear about that, uh, Clinton also took some time to make fun of the people who don't believe in these ESG regulations. We were just so I guess he's making fun of us because we think they're a fraud. It doesn't hurt my feelings. It doesn't hurt my feelings either. Um, and he called them basically climate change deniers. Like if you're laughing at ESG regulations, you're a climate change denier. Anyone that opposes them must hate the environment. Listen, I want to say one thing about Larry that I really admire, quite apart from the fact that he's not a climate change denier. <laughs> uh, I'm the target of all those. <laughs> he, th this may be more important. I think one of the two or three factors most responsible for an unsustainable rate of inequality in the world today is that decades ago, actually, when Hillary and I were in law school, that's a long time ago, <laughs> in the United States and elsewhere, people stopped teaching corporate law the way it used to be taught. It, 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 corporations, when I was a kid coming up and when I went to law school, were creatures of the state who had responsibilities to all their stakeholders. So yes, they're investors. So he's basically taking a play right out of Klaus Schwab's Klaus Schwab's book, right? Oh, they were inve they were stakeholder investors, right? Mm -hmm. Or they were they were shareholder investors, right? They yes. cared more about their their shares uh, in their, than they did the act in the environment. They were so they were climate change deniers. Yes, and that was the root of the problem. That's why we have these problems today from these big companies. He says. One of my favorite parts of this, though, came back when BlackRock Larry Fink, CEO, actually claimed that ESG pushing up energy prices is a good thing. He said uh, this is what they all want as part of the plan. Basically, they want this plan. They want to drive up the prices. He says this is good. Energy prices going up. This is a great thing because it then, it, you know, it, you'll have to start using our crappy renewable technologies that don't work and will not solve the problem. Listen. Because of the rising energy prices, we are certainly seeing the green premium shrink quite considerably. And so the amount of investment dollars that are going into new decarbonization technology is accelerating and accelerating very rapidly. Oh, good. So that's part of the plan. Is it, though? Because by many measures, investment in new technology is down by, I think, 75 percent since the 80s. If you by some measures, right. so okay, what are they talking about? They're talking about existing technology, right? That really will slow the tech that will slow up the economy. For instance, I was reading today that Uber says that its entire fleet will be electric by 2030. And I was thinking they really don't care about their drivers because if a driver has to plug in to recharge on their shift, that's fewer, that's less, fewer rides they can take, right. less money they can make. Right. And so, and we're, 
you know, by many measures, electric cars are not much better for the environment than gas powered cars. So they're just saying, we don't care if these people have to slow down and make less money. This is what we think is the woke thing to do. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think the data is really showing us that, that electric cars are probably aren't even better for the environment at all. Like we've been no. sold a bill of goods on that entirely. Like the amount of, t the amount of energy it takes to actually charge an electric car compared to what it actually costs to, to power a refrigerator um, is, you know, it's like 10 to one. Yeah. And the amount of money that, of course, has to go into powering the grid as a result of it, using fossil fuels to do it, really doesn't make any sense anyway. But anyway, uh, they didn't stop there. Larry Fink doesn't have enough money uh, and doesn't own almost all the entire world. He wants the International Monetary Fund now to actually change their charter and the World Bank to bring around the Great Reset Revolution. By changing these charters, it would force the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank to only lend money to countries that have changed their environmental policies. This is what he wants, listen. But if we are going to change the world, there's just not enough money that's gonna go into the emerging world. And we must change the charters of the IMF and the World Bank, or we're, or we're not gonna get there. There's just not, there's just not enough capital it is estimated to decarbonize the emerging world is a trillion dollars a year. We're talking maybe a hundred billion dollars is moving into the, the emerging world. And so, so That's we a really stupid thing to applaud. So you, I know, think about, let's unpack that a little bit. You need to, we need to lend money because you're lending it to these poor African nations, right? And they will be then indebted to you forever. That's the plan, right? But we need to change the charter such that we do that. But they ha it really has to be around you also then investing in uh, uh, renewable energy sources. That's how we will lend you this money. That we deem are right. acceptable, right? right. Um, because a lot of the renewables they champion right now will not lower the temperature by any goal of the Paris Climate Accord at all. Right. Um, so it's not really about results never has been it's just about which ones we ordain right. with our king staff so bill clinton was asked we, we're I'm not sure like whoa philip first <laughs> yes okay so the the imf has been actually doing that uh politically and like with austerity measures for a really long time like they lend money to a to a country in need and then they're like okay but in order to get this you have to you have to have a specific government you have to have uh, you know, like all of the, these um, like austerity measures, you, you like they basically don't like socialism. And so it's it's just interesting that now they're wanting to because, you know, they're not going to change their charter. If they were to a able to convince the IMF to change, they're not going to change their charter. They're just going to pile more stuff on. Yeah. Right. And make it impossible for these countries. Yeah. To get out of debt ever. Yeah. Ever, ever. That's the thing. David, go ahead. I was just going to say that the Lolita Express must have been a very fuel efficient plane. <laughs> yes. Totally. Yeah, Bill Clinton, Larry Fink, Epstein, the Lolita Epstein Express. Um, so all of this printing of money, of course, will continue. Uh, when asked by Bill Clinton about where the money is going to come from to facilitate this global ESG transition, one of the UN's ESG czars said, just like how we found $17 trillion for COVID, the money must be there somewhere. This part blew me away. Watch. About that. I think first, just like Alan said, first recognize it's a crisis. And, you know, just to how we found is it 14 or 17 trillion for COVID, the money must be there somewhere. Oh, it must be. So just, okay. we have to label it a crisis, which we've done, right? We know now that The Guardian has mandated its reporters to label when they talk about climate, they cannot call it the climate change anymore. As the newspaper, they have to call it climate crisis. Every time they print that, those words, that's part of their Yes. What they have to call it. So we've already got this idea down that there's a climate crisis, climate crisis. Um, so we'll find the money. 17 trillion that we printed out of nowhere for COVID. We'll find the money. And we'll Tell that to families who are hurting in this economy. Um, if you're really in an emergency, you'll find the money. Yeah. 